So welcome back. This is going to be our second screencast for Chapter 2. And if you remember, in Chapter 2, we are looking at organic chemistry. So we're looking at the chemistry of um, living compounds. And so in Section 2.2, we need to um, look at the properties of water because, of course, water is really, really important when it comes down to living things. Now, a few statistics about water. Water makes up about three-fourths of the Earth's surface. Uh, water is the only compound found naturally on Earth as either a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Unlike other liquids, water will expand when it freezes. Water is the most abundant compound in living things. Um, if you look at almost any living thing on this planet, you're going to find that it's around 70% water, and that does include the human body. And a healthy person um, can drink actually about three gallons of water per day. Now, since we are talking about organic chemistry, we do need to look at the chemical makeup of water. So the water molecule consists of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, and these are going to be joined by covalent bonds. So remember, a covalent bond is going to be a bonding mechanism that actually shares an electron between two atoms. So down here towards the bottom, you can see the oxygen atom at the bottom, and you can see the two hydrogen atoms towards the top. And the yellow and the green um, spheres that you see right here represent the electrons that are surrounding the um, nucleus of that atom. And remember, the nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons. And so this particular electron is going to be shared with that oxygen. And so if you notice, this is where we end up with that bonding that's going to occur. And again, that bond is going to be a covalent bond. Now, one thing we often talk about when it comes down to um, water is that water has a couple of characteristics that makes it kind of unique. Uh, one of those characteristics is going to be its ability to be polar. Um, when you talk about polarity, polarity is essentially the unequal sharing of electrons in a molecule. Now, water is a polar molecule because the shared electrons tend to spend more time near the oxygen atom as opposed to the hydrogen atoms that are part of that structure. And so if you look over here on the right hand side, you're going to notice that this is sort of an illustration, again, of the bonding that occurs between the oxygen and the hydrogens. And so because these hydrogen atoms tend to spend more time towards this end of the molecule, we're going to find that it tends to be more positive on this side, and it tends to be more negative on this side. Now, the second characteristic we would look at when it comes down to water, as we had said, is the ability of water to form what we call hydrogen bonds. And so when you're talking about attractions between specific water molecules, for example, maybe this entire molecule being attracted to this molecule, we're going to find that the bonds that actually cause that attraction to occur are going to be considered hydrogen bonds. Now, hydrogen bonds gives water two very important properties. Um, again, as we said, because of those hydrogen bonds, it's causing those um, individual water molecules to kind of be attracted towards each other. Now, the two properties we're looking at here as a result of that hydrogen bonding, one of those is cohesion, and the second is adhesion. Now, cohesion is an attraction between molecules of the same substance. And so in this case, if you look at this bug over here on the right-hand side, this um, insect is able to um, basically walk on water because there is an attraction between each of the water molecules that make up that pool of water. It's going to give water what we call its surface tension. And depending on how the weight of that insect is spread across the surface of the water, might actually allow it to walk on water because it's not breaking the hydrogen bonds that connect those water molecules together. Now it's also going to give water a high boiling point and for water that boiling point is around 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Now the second property is adhesion and this is an attraction between the molecules of different substances and so this is the part of this definition that makes adhesion different from cohesion. Again, cohesion is an attraction between molecules of the same substance. Adhesion is different substances. And so if you look at um, a graduated cylinder, this is going to give the sort of curved surface that you would notice in the meniscus 
of a glass container. So you don't see that water actually going straight across. There's sort of a little bend in it right here, and that's the meniscus of the water. And that's as a result of adhesion. And so the water is being pulled up or attracted to the molecules of the glass. Now another good example of adhesion is the um, capillary action that you would find in a very narrow glass tube. And if you look over here again to the right, you can see the liquid in this Petri dish. It's rising up the tube because those molecules of water are being attracted to the molecules of the glass. Now another characteristic of water is it does tend to um, be part of most mixtures. Now, a mixture is essentially a substance that is composed of two or more elements or compounds that are physically mixed together, but the important part of this definition is they are not chemically combined, and so they essentially um, retain their properties. In this picture in the middle, you can see that on the far left-hand side, these are essentially atoms of an element. These are molecules of an element because you have the same element, but they're attracted towards each other. Um, these would be the molecules of a compound. And over here, you have a mixture of elements and a compound. So in this case, you have all three of these items mixed together. But again, you can notice no chemical combining is taking place because the structure of these particular um, um, particles has not changed. You still have the molecules, you still have the compounds, and you still have the individual atoms. Now when you talk about mixtures with water, they're essentially divided into two categories. They're either going to be considered solutions or they're going to be considered suspensions. Now a solution is going to be a mixture in which one substance is evenly dissolved into another. Now a really good example of this is going to be salt water. You have two parts of a solution. The first part being the solid, in this case it would be the salt for salt water. This is going to be called the solute and the second is going to be the solvent. And the solvent in this case, of course, which we're talking about, is water. Now over here on the left, you can see the solid NaCl. So you can see sort of the chemical composition of that solid. And over here, you can see a beaker with salt that's been dissolved into the solvent or into the water. And so here you can see a mixture between those two items, both the um, sodium ion, you can see the chloride ion, and you can see the water molecules here. Now, on Earth, we consider water the universal solvent. Now, the second category of mixtures is going to be a suspension. And a suspension is simply a mixture of water and a non-dissolved material that will not settle. And in this case, we would be talking about blood. And so here you can see a really good illustration of this. Blood's going to divide itself into basically three um, areas. It's going to be the plasma on the top, the white blood cells in the middle, and the red blood cells on the bottom. So again, a suspension is going to cause these particles to stay suspended within that water at certain parts of the containers. Now you can't talk about water without talking about the um, ability of water to be either an acid, a base, or a neutral solution. So water can react actually to form hydrogen ions, which are these H plus ions, and hydroxide ions, which are going to be these OH negative ions. Now the water that we would start off with, if you notice in this chemical equation, as we had said, can produce both of these ions, but since we have an arrow that is pointing both directions, that means that these two ions could actually combine and form water. So this is going to occur in about one out of 550 million water molecules. Now water is considered a neutral substance because it forms an equal number of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. So what does this mean? Basically it means that if it's not a neutral substance, if we have maybe more of one or the other, if we maybe we have more H pluses than we do the OH negatives, then we're going to have something called an acid. Um, a good example of an acid maybe that you've experienced in the classroom would be HCl or hydrochloric acid. So what happens here is we have a very large number of these H plus ions in solution. And when that occurs, when there's sort of an unequal distribution of the H plus and the OH negatives, we consider it an acidic solution. Now, one of the characteristics of an acid is it often tastes sour. Think about um, a lemon, for example. If, if you drink lemon juice, it tastes very sour. Grapefruit would be another good example of an acid-based substance. Now, on the flip side of that, we have bases. Now, bases are different because instead of having a higher number of H pluses over OH negatives, it's the other way around. We have more OH negatives than we do H pluses in solution. And a good example of a base would be sodium hydroxide, and that's something that we would often use in the classroom. 
Um, basic solutions, as we had said, contain a lower concentration of those H plus ions than water. Now, as I had said, you're always looking at the ratios between the H pluses and the OH negatives. And so if we have an equal number of both, we would consider the substance neutral. And so that's basically water. Um, if you have more H pluses, it's going to be acid. If you have more OH negatives, it's going to be considered a base. Now, a characteristic of bases that's a little bit different from acids is that um, First off, instead of tasting sour, bases are going to tend to taste bitter. And when you look at the texture or the feeling of a base, they often tend to feel slippery. Now, so of course, when you talk about acids and bases, we need to make sure that we have a way to actually measure the concentration of those H plus ions in solution. Of course, that's in relation to the OH negatives that are also there as well. When you talk about an acid and you talk about this scale, we're looking at a scale that goes from 0 to 14. And if you have a pH, if you have a reading that is less than 7, we're going to consider that an acid. Now, if it's an acid, that means we have more of the H plus ions than we have of the OH negative ions. So we have more H pluses. If it's considered neutral, it means that we have an equal amount of H pluses and OH negative ions. And if we have a pH that is greater than 7, then we're going to consider that a base. And that means we have less H plus ions than we do OH, let me scribble that out, OH negative ions. And so we have more OHs in the solution than we do H pluses. Now down towards the bottom, you can see just an example of this pH scale, and you're going to work with this scale in class. Um, but it kind of gives you an idea of the different substances you might find, say, for example, in a grocery store um, and how they sort of relate to this scale. And again, water tends to be in the middle. It tends to be really close to 7. Um, things like baking soda, ammonia, drain cleaner. A lot of our cleaners tend to be in the basic range. And then some of the things that we might use as food items, for example, like lemons, apples, bananas, vinegar, tomatoes, um, are going to be in the acidic range. And of course, as we get closer to 0, it becomes more acidic. As we get closer to that 7, it becomes less acidic. Now, on the base side, it's a little bit different because if you notice, as we get further away, it does get stronger. 14 does represent a really strong base. Um, as we get closer to 7, it does re basically represent sort of a weaker base. Now, the last thing we need to talk about in regards to um, pH is sometimes what we need to do is we need to use things called buffers. And if you have strong acids and bases, they can be very reactive and sometimes they can cause severe burns. So substances that react with these strong acids and these strong bases um, to resist those major changes in pH are often called buffers. Now buffers are going to be those some things that are going to help organisms maintain a constant pH in their body. So a buffer is going to make sure that that um, particular pH doesn't change too um, drastically. Um, for example, human body fluids pH usually is kept between a 6.5 and a 7.4 range. And again, that's relatively neutral. So we have buffers in our body that help to keep that um, relatively constant or stable. All right, so that's going to finish up our second screencast for Chapter 2. And I know it's been a quick turnaround because we just had 2.1, um, but we kind of need to get this um, pre-chemistry stuff out of the way so we can get into the organic molecules that we're going to look at in 2.3. Now, as always, please make sure that you get your screencast notes done before you come to class.